Hey, and welcome everybody. It's Roger Terry here. Welcome to the Wednesday webinar on the roots of indecision. I hope a few of you have already logged in. So we've got nine people here already, so that's great. I'm going to just uh, see that you can hear me. Uh, just type into the chat box if you can hear me okay and everything's, everything's running. And then we'll get on with the webinar. You can just say hi or I'm here and I can hear you, that'd be great. Hey, great. Last time we did this, we had some problems with the uh, with the technology, but it seems that we're doing well. Yes, there's lots of people saying yes, they can hear me, so that's fantastic. So this this Wednesday webinar is on the roots of indecision. It's about that uh, those times when we get into indecision, when we can't make our mind up. Just uh, just let me know uh, if this is something that you get uh, you get from time to time. So you can just type in a little bit on the chat box. You know, we're all, I think part of the indecision is we'll come to, when I come to the presentation and you'll see that, you know, I think that a lot of this is part of our natural condition and it's actually quite useful. So, yeah, people are saying, yes, they, yes, they are occasionally. <laughs> okay, good. And other people are saying, yes, that's fantastic. That's excellent. Okay, well, uh, without much to do, I'm going to just pull up the PowerPoint. So I'm going to disappear from your screens and... And I'll review replaced by the PowerPoint, and then we'll uh, we'll walk through these uh, some of my notions on indecision and um, and how we might find a way out of that. So just bear with me a second while I switch over to the screen share. Okay, you should be seeing that uh, just about now. So sometimes this indecision is quite deep rooted in us, and this is why I call this the roots of indecision. This was a request from uh, one of the people on the first webinar to tackle. So we get into a state, you know, yes, maybe no, and uh, how many of you um, suffer from this, get into this state maybe once a week, or sometimes perhaps daily, maybe one time a month, just uh, give me some idea of you know how often you end up into uh, into a place where you're oh you're just trying to make your mind up and you don't know whether you're going to go this way or that way, so that I get a sense of just how how this affects you. Daily, Steve says daily. <laughs> Andrew says yes, me too. I don't know whether that's a message from earlier on. I think it's something that we all once a week roughly. <laughs> It's what, something that we all we all suffer from, and it's something that you know can drive us mad at times. I know, approximately monthly. Janet says, "Okay, that's great." So I had a look. You know, I had a little. I had a look at the uh, the dictionary to see what that said. Some saying a few times a week. So what that said. So let's have a little look at some of the definitions of indecision that you get from the dictionaries. State of being unable to make a choice. Seems pretty obvious. The inability to make decisions quickly. So there's some speed element here that perhaps we think we should make decisions quickly. That's coming straight from I think Webster's dictionary. Wavering between one or two, one or two or more possible courses of action. I think that's pretty, pretty good. And the last one is a reluctance or inability to make up your one, one's mind. And there seems to be some sort of intention there that you know we get reluctant to make our mind up. So it's interesting what the dictionary says. Uh, around this. Andrea's saying she gets this indecision around tough, tough decisions. Yeah, absolutely. The tougher the decision, the more likely you're to flip into this kind of indecisive state. What's interesting about this is that, you know, we are creatures of habit and that impacts us too. This is what uh, one of my heroes, uh, Bertrand Russell, says about indecision. Nothing so exhausting as indecision and nothing so futile. I think that's a a wise thing to say. You know, when we when we get into these states of indecision, it's tiring. Our brains are going uh, twenty to the dozen. We're 
We're flipping backwards and forwards between things. Jackie says weekly on Hearst. Okay. So let's have a, a look and see, you know, what is it about this indecisiveness? You know, why do we end up feeling decisive? I had to think about this, and I think, you know, the first thing I want to say, I think there's something around this that it's a bit of a fail-safe mechanism to make sure we assess the risks involved. When we're we're trying to make our mind up, essentially this is what we're doing. We're we're, we're trying to assess the risk involved. Sometimes you know, that goes a little bit too far. We, we end up in a place where we're overthinking things. And we can even get into that place, which is often called analysis paralysis. We get we overthink things so much that we just completely get stuck. But the thing with indecision is it also triggers lots of states inside us, and it triggers sets of beliefs about what we should be able to do, what we should be able to say, what we should be able to feel. And once we've done this a few times, you know, uh, we tend to form habits around this. So once we've had a, a, a place where we've been indecisive a number of times, our brain remembers how to do it, and then tends to push us down this route any time we feel any time we have to make a decision between two things and the more important the decision the more it's likely to trigger a state inside ourselves and then trigger all the beliefs about about us essentially you know it's about our self-worth you know how can we make a decision what should I do you know and if you hear yourself saying things about what what should I do here you might think there's, there's possibly some beliefs kicking around there these are the kind of language clues that um, when you've done a little bit of NLP you find that you can pick up in yourself and other people. Well, the way we, one way we can look at this uh, in NLP is that this can cause some sort of internal split. And this is in our language. We talk about um, part of me would like to do this and part of me want to do that. And these parts, we can consider them as having their own intentions. And this is often a good way to get to deal with um, to deal with indecision. Now we're going to come to this in a little bit, but basically, once we get into a state of indecision, once those beliefs get triggered, once we're, once we, once we, once we move into that state, what we end up with is being out of alignment. So I thought this is interesting. I thought, well, I have a look. You know, because this is a human condition. I'll have a look and see. You know, what are the tools out there that I could find for um, making decisions? It was interesting, so I'm going to show you just a few of these tools. So here are the decision-making tools that I found. Some of them I was familiar with and some of them not. There's a decision tree. You can do grid analysis, Pareto analysis, do cost benefits, matched pairs, fishbone analysis, decision table. You could, it is clearly something that's, that human beings have struggled with for, for a while because there are so many different tools for making decisions. Weighted tables, Delphi technique, I'm not sure what that one is. Force field analysis, nominal grouping, ranking, heart, one heart plus one, weighted and multi-voting, check sheets, swaps and pests. So any number of different ways to, to come to a decision. So this does mean that we've been suffering from this as human beings for a long time. I looked at these tools and it, and it occurred to me that, in fact, what do they have in common? Well, they all seem to me to be very left brain mental tools and techniques. And maybe this is where we can make a little bit of a diversion and start to engage a different different parts of us. They'll tend to break things down to the smaller parts and that might be useful, but often you'll end up with more decisions to make. Things get more complicated. So how can we uh, how can we apply some NLP, apply some NLP model that might help us be able to move out of this kind of state and beliefs and make decisions a little bit more easily. So let's apply some NLP thinking. So what's happening? We're going to answer some of these questions. How can you change it? What will the NLP tools that will be useful here? And what would it be like when you've changed it? It's always good to start off with that simple model of where are we now and where do I want to be? Now, 
let's think about, I talked a little bit about having parts of us, but we, this is a, how, our, how our consciousness operates in a large part. We have many identities, and we have lots of them. I'll just illustrate a few. So we can be a, a dad or a mum, we can be a husband or a wife, son or daughter, a brother or a sister. Those are our relations, there's some of our relationship identities that we access every day and we'll switch between one and the other part of us as a dad and it's pretty different to the part of you that might be a brother or it might or different from you from the part of you that's a lover. Then we have more archetypal identities. These are the kind of identities that, that drive us at a deeper level and these have been identified in many different ways. I've just put a few here, priest and priest or server, artisan and warrior, king, sage and scholar. Some of these archetypes live inside us, you know, some part, sometimes we need to be a warrior. Sometimes when we're making things and doing things around the house, maybe we feel like we're more like an artisan. Sometimes we feel like a king. Sometimes people want us to be a sage. So there's another set of archetypal identities that, we, that operate. And then we've got all our work identities, you know, who are you at work? You might be an engineer or a doctor, you might be a, a nurse, there could be, you know, it's a myriad of identities, and we switch happily between these identities most of the time. And that's part of that's part of the way that we can think about working in parts. You know, we can have parts of us. Oh, so Andrea, I was just going to stop for a second. Andrea says, "What does NLP stand for?" And Annette kind of said, "Neuro linguistic programming." So. This is about how, I'll just do a, a little quick, so neuro-linguistic programming is it's about our neurology, our senses, our five senses, how our language interacts with that, and how, how we're programmed. Programming you can think of as habits and those patterns that we run every day. Neuro-linguistic programming gives us a way of taking those apart and looking at what makes us tick and then having some tools to change that. So I hope that's a bit of a, a reason, a little bit of an explanation for Andrea so that she can get a little bit of a bigger idea about what it is. So let's go back to the identities. So we have lots of these identities and we talk about, you know, part of me wants to do this, part of me wants to do that, part of me is a X and part of me is a Y. This is in our language. And the other new piece of uh, evidence coming along in the neuroscience field is that we actually have three brains. So we're really thinking about how things can get out of alignment. We have three, three brains and uh, we're going to use, we're going to do a little bit with these three brains today to get us out of, to see how we can move ourselves out of indecision. And this is a webinar, it's much better to do this live, but it's a webinar so we'll see how we get on. It's a bit of an experiment on my part. So we've got the brain we all know about our head brain, the cephalatic brain. It has between 50 and 100 billion neurons. So it's a big, it's a big brain. It's the biggest, biggest computer around. It sits between our ears. It's our cognitive functions. Now I'm going to just you do this very briefly because um, we want to be able to use this idea a bit later on. So our head brain is responsible for our thinking. This is where most of us spend most of the time. Then the second brain is our heart brain. This is much a much smaller neural network between 30 to 120,000 neurons. And it's really concerned with our emotional state. And we say this, don't we? My heart's not in it. And we have lots of we have lots of expressions in our language that talk about that talk about these brains. And the third brain is our gut brain. This is our or enteric brain, if you like. 20 to 200 to 500 million neurons. So it's the kind of, it, you could think of this brain as being about the size of a cat's brain. And it's our ancient brain. We've had this brain uh, since we were crawling about in the slime and, it, and, it, and it's, it detects poisonous stuff, it detects what's good to eat, it's our, it moves us towards and away from things. So it's, it has a motive, a motive functionality. And you know, we say, you know, we have gut feelings say, oh, had a had a, a good feeling about that, good feeling in my gut about that night and I did it. So often, you know, this is the way this this brain communicates. They all communicate in slightly different ways. 
And we can, we can find that out by putting our attention on there, and we're going to do this a little bit later on. So here we have, you know, new neuroscience, three neural networks that seem to be able to, that seem to need, that seem to need to be aligned. So there's lots of things that can move out of alignment. There are our little identities, there are three brains, and there are the way that we generate a part around a place where we need to make a decision. And we end up with something like this. So a part of me wants something. Maybe a part of me wants to retire and a part of me wants to carry on working, a part of me wants to go on holiday and a part of me wants to stay home and do the decorating. There are many, many places where, where we use this kind of language. And then the other part, another part wants something else. So generally in a decision, we can identify in this way and say, well, part of me wants to do this and part of me wants to do that. And that's a good place to start because we'll actually start defining these parts and we can see what we can do with them to make it, to get some alignment. I'm quite fond of Charlie Brown. So you end up, sometimes you end up at war in, inside. You end up in a lot of internal conflict. It keeps you up at night, it goes round and round in your head. How many people, how many people end up losing sleep over decisions that they need to make? Just give us a quick type in, in the box so I can see that you're still around. Yeah, Andrea says, indecision seems to suffocate my butt brain. People say, listen to your gut. I, I, I don't know, trust or understand what that means. Okay, and I think that's, that's not unusual. Um, we're not used to listening to our gut. We are so um, prone to um, our brain. This, this culture is so much tied up with the, in fact, the left side of our brain that we, we've, in a way, lose the lose the way of listening to our gut because we sort of expect the, we, we have this in, the internal dialogue that happens inside our head brain and maybe there's a little bit of an expectation that that's going to go on our gut brain. That's not really the way the gut brain communicates. So what, uh, what we're going to do a little bit later on is uh, just have a little bit of an experiment and, and see if we can listen in a different way for these for these communications from the brain when we're wanting to check whether we've got ourselves into alignment. So let's go back to the path. So we have a, we, we have a decision to make where we're, we're wavering between two poles, one part of you wants this and another part wants that. That's actually quite a good way to start thinking about this. So how do we get, first? the first thing we need to do in order to make a decision, we need to get these parts into alignment. As long as they're out of alignment, then well, we won't be able to make a decision easily. So this is the uh, the next thing to do. So here's uh, a little sheet, a little sheet. And if you've got a bit of paper handy, then this is something that you can you can do quite easily. And we're going to work down this sheet. So the easiest thing to do is to make two columns, and we're going to use a repeating question, which is a pretty cool way to get it uh, to get it some answers there's an interesting uh, assumption in NLP uh, it's called a presupposition and it goes something like this it, we cannot not answer a question so that's right isn't it so if you have caught that so somewhere inside of you you will have attempted to answer that question if, if you, any question that we get answered that we get asked somewhere inside us how our our mind, our mind and body are, will attempt to answer it. You won't always get words as an answer, but somewhere inside there's an answer to a question. So we can use that principle to actually shift us out of alignment. So you can see this, this um, the sheet has two, two columns, part of me, both of which are headed part of me, and that's the kind of dilemma. So in the top box you can write, part of me wants X and part of me wants Y. And then we're simply going to work down the columns. And so whatever the first part wants, the question you ask is, if you got that, what would it do for you? Or what would it do for me? And then you pop your answer in the white box. So if you've got, 
if you've got a dilemma, you can experiment with this now, or you can have a play with it afterwards. Because of the principle of we cannot not answer a question, if you allow yourself a little bit of space and listen, you'll, you'll get an answer. So you write that answer in the box. And then you say, well, if I got that, what would that do for me? And you get yet another answer. And you repeat that. Now, I've only got three repetitions in here. It might take you more than three repetitions to, to get to the bottom. You'll get to something like happiness, peace, some, some quality like that. Then you take the second column, whatever that wants, and you ask the same question. If I've got that, what would it do for me? Write the answer down and then carry on in the same way. But that's for the first answer you asked. If I got that, what would that do for me? And if I got that, what would that do for me? What you'll end up with is a, what I would call a harmonized outcome. You'll end up with both parts wanting something similar. When you, or something, or it may even turn out that they both end up wanting the same thing. Now, when you get to that point, well, you've achieved something. You've, you've actually achieved those two parts becoming aligned at a higher level. So they're both going for the same thing. Now, when you've got those parts aligned, it's much easier to make a decision because you've calmed down the internal conflict. In fact, you've, in most times you've re re resolved the internal conflict by, having this, by harmonizing the two parts. So that's the little scheme. If you, uh, if you want to a little PDF with this on it, then you can drop me an email and I'll, I'll send one out to you. you. Any questions around that? Any questions around that? You can just type that in the box. Steve, generally, I, Steve says you might end up with a mix of positive and negatives. So m most of the time, if you pursue it, you'll end up with a positive. So sometimes it's just a question of keeping going. And one of the things that uh, I didn't say, but we could say, so one of the things to assume is that each one of these parts has a positive intention. So what we're looking for is the positive intention. Okay, and that, that kind of helps. So it's a little bit of persistence to get them aligned. This is not, these are not the only questions. I've, I've just picked this particular question because it's usually the easiest one to work with. There are... Um, there are more sophisticated questions that you can ask, but in a webinar like this, um, this is the simplest way to do it. But you are looking for that harmonized outcome and you're looking for that, for those parts to have a positive intention. You could ask the, you could ask the question of, you know, what's the positive intention of this part? That would do also work. Okay, John's got chocolate or vanilla, I'd feel satisfied with either. So you've got to some sort of harmonized outcome, that's great. Okay, so once we get aligned, then that allows us to move into a place where we might, we can return to the situation. So we return back to that decision. So you can consider the situation on terms and listen to something different. So one of the ways you can do this is to put your attention firstly in at your heart. So we can move. We mostly we live with our attention, um, attention behind our eyes. And what we can do is we can allow our attention to 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 move down to our heart. And it takes a little bit of practice. If you move your attention to your heart, go back to that situation. Put your attention to your heart and just and just be open to what comes. I'll give you some way of, uh, of identifying things in a moment. But that's the first thing to do. Second thing, notice we're not going to the head first. Put your attention on your gut. And notice what sensations you have in your gut. Because that's the way your gut communicates with it. It doesn't communicate in words, it communicates in sensations. You know, we even say that, you know, I've got butterflies in my stomach, I've got a sinking feeling. This is, these are all descriptions of how our gut is communicating to us. 
we say we're light-hearted. We've got a heavy heart. And then put your attention on your head and, and notice what happens when you move back to your head. Now, here's, the, uh, here's a way of telling what's going on. In my brains. One of, the, one of the ways to make an assessment is notice if the sensations feel heavy or light. If you have light sensations in all places, then you move into a place of alignment. And you'll be in a better position to take an aligned decision. It takes a little bit of practice and a little bit of sensory acuity to begin to notice. These are not the only sensations, but light and heavy sensations are a, a good indication uh, and a good way of picking up the communication from these from these three brains, particularly the heart and gut brain. So now we've, uh, in a place of indecision, we've taken the two parts and we've worked a little bit with them to get them aligned. Then we've taken that, that taken, taken ourselves in that more aligned place back to the decision we need to make. And instead of asking ourselves questions inside our mind and triggering off a lot of internal dialogue, what we've done is we've used our attention and moved our attention into our heart. Notice if we get heavy or light sensations into our gut and finally into our head. When they're all aligned and you get light sensations, then you're in a much better position to take a decision. And you'll find the decisions will be easier to make. If you, if you don't get that alignment, then simply take a look back at the past and see if there's something you've missed. This is all using the right brain in your body to get yourself aligned, rather than your left brain, as we talked about earlier. So the results of this, you know, more alignment, less indecision, and, and the other thing you're doing when you're doing this, we're, we're establishing a new program or a new pattern. It's neuro-linguistic programming. So we're using our neurology, those nervous systems. We're using our language by asking questions and listening for answers in a different way. And we are, we are reprogramming ourselves. The more we take this approach, the more we'll be able to cope with the indecision. We get this new strategy for decisions. And you'll build up your sensory acuity so you'll be able to hear the messages from your three brains and from those other parts of you more clearly. And when we do that, we can integrate ourselves much more, much more readily. And this is just the start of what is possible. I've given you a, a technique which is pretty much designed to be uh, delivered over a webinar. Um, when you when you come and train, then this technique takes on a, a more three-dimensional appro approach, and we're much we're much more able to see how and feel how these approaches work with each other and with ourselves. Are there any questions? before we just tidy up and, and finish off in a moment. Any questions about what we've done? Is that helpful? Is there something you'd like to do on the next webinar? I always ask at this point that uh, if there's, if there's uh, a topic or two for the next webinar, I'm really happy to, to take a topic and look at, look at the applications for NLP and see how we can, we can apply some NLP to some real life problems. not having any questions coming through. Okay.
Okay, and that's saying she's got a big decision to make at the moment. She'll take it through this. Okay, and now if you if you get uh, if you get stuck, give me a call. I'm happy to talk on the phone if you want. And Andrea too, yes, that's cool. Um, you're all welcome to drop me an email or, or give me a call. I'll do my best to answer your questions. Um, Jackie says she loves the past stuff. It's absolutely brilliant the past stuff, and this is you know this you can do a limited amount on the webinar, and it's great to. Um, it's great to be able to work one-to-one -one and in person with people, and really that's the best way to work with NLP. We can do some stuff on the webinar and uh, other stuff. So just to give you a quick um, rundown of what's coming up for Revolution training, the practitioner training starts, starts soon, and the, uh, we have uh, two diploma courses, which are really, really the first... Um, are really the first part of the practitioner training. I'm just watching the messages coming through. Uh, yep, yeah, and uh, that's excellent. It's chocolate's night, says John. <laughs> that's great. So the practitioner training is really four modules. The first one's a separate certificate module, uh, which, uh, <coughs> which is the uh, diploma. We've got two of those coming, the 31st and 3rd of April and the 3rd to the 6th of March. <laughs> and that takes you onto the practitioner course where there's three more modules where you can you really get into detail and uh, begin to um, begin to really penetrate some of the stuff and be, get more understanding of the sort of stuff we've done this evening. And the last part of that is uh, when, you, uh, when you've got your practitioner, you can go on to master practitioner. It's a, it's a five module course, it really, it allows you to create the life you want. It has some fantastic tools and some great development and transformation in that. Uh, in that, so if you're interested in any of these, uh, any of these uh, trainings, if that, uh, if you want to talk about them, I'm really happy. Emily and I are really happy to chat about them. Then uh, we've also got. Uh, if you've done, the, if you've been on the webinar, then. Uh, it entice you to some special VIP prices, and you can just call, or, call us or email us to find out. We're really happy to talk about how NLP can help you and how you can access the trainings. We do our very best to make the trainings available to as many as people as possible, and it's a, a, a wonderful thing to, uh, to have in your life. And really, that's it. Um, it's 9.33. I've overrun by three minutes for this half-hour webinar. Um, haven't had a request for the next time. Um, still a couple of seconds to to do that before we go off air. And uh, thanks very much for listening. It's really been great to have you here. And again, any questions, thoughts, or requests for other topics, please email me. You've got my email on the screen at the moment. And uh, Jackie says she can guarantee it's exactly as Roger says. That's great. So, give me an email, give me a call, it'd be great to talk to you. And thank you very much, and we're going to go off air right now. Thank you, everybody, and I'll see you on the next webinar.